In a previous video we looked at and repaired a 50mm Super Takamar f1.4 lens. I'll put a link to that video in the description. As mentioned in that video, these lenses are radioactive. In this video we'll try to find out how radioactive they are in relation to some other household items. These lenses use thoriated glass. In other words, the glass contains thorium, which is a radioactive element. The thorium is actually mixed into the molten glass during manufacture and is not just a coating on the surface. The thorium was added to improve the optical performance of the glass, and therefore the lens itself. A job which it did very well. There were only a couple of side effects. Firstly, that the lens was radioactive, and secondly, that over time the glass can gain a yellowish-brown tint, as can be seen on my lens. This tinting of the glass can be reversed by exposing the lens to ultraviolet light. I've often read that these lenses only emit alpha radiation, which is fairly weak and can be blocked by a sheet of paper and won't penetrate human skin. This is sort of correct, but also incorrect. Thorium is indeed an alpha radiation emitting element, but as it decays it produces radioactive daughter isotopes that emit other forms of radiation. So now for a very remedial, and possibly not totally accurate, physics lesson. If we look at an atom, at its centre is the nucleus, made up of protons, which have a positive charge, and neutrons, which have no charge. Circling the nucleus are the electrons, which have a negative charge. These positive protons and neutral neutrons are held together by a strong nuclear force. An atom with an equal amount of protons and neutrons will be stable, but if it has a non-equal amount it will be unstable or radioactive. The unstable atom will release energy either in the form of particles or waves until eventually the atom becomes stable again. This process is known as radioactive decay, and you can have alpha particles which travel a short distance and can't penetrate very well, beta particles which travel a bit further and have a bit of penetrating power, and then finally there's gamma waves which have much more penetrating power. If we take a thorium atom, when it decays and releases its alpha particle, it then becomes a new element two places lower in the periodic table, which would make it radium. If we then look at that radium atom, when it decays it releases a beta particle. It then becomes a new isotope one place higher on the periodic table, making it actinium. Similarly, when the actinium decays, it releases a beta particle. It then forms a new isotope one place higher on the periodic table, making it thorium. Although this time it's thorium-228 rather than the thorium-232 that we started off with. This process carries on down the periodic table until the atom becomes stable in the form of lead. Anyway, that's a very simplified explanation, but it should hopefully explain why these thoriated lenses don't just emit alpha radiation. So I've got myself a Geiger counter, and in a bit we'll carry out some tests on the lens, along with a few other household items. My Geiger counter is sensitive to beta radiation, gamma radiation and X-ray, but it won't detect alpha radiation. For alpha you need a special type of probe with a mica window, so we won't be able to see how much alpha radiation is being emitted, but we will be able to see other forms of radiation. This Geiger counter has a Muller tube which is located at the bottom of the unit. It can display radiation in counts per minute. Normal background radiation fluctuates all the time, but somewhere between 10 and 40 counts per minute seems fairly normal. Then it can display a dosage rate. It's currently showing microsieverts per hour. And at the bottom are the maximum counts per minute that the unit has been exposed to so far. The display can also be switched to show milliroentgens per hour, but for these tests we'll stick to microsieverts per hour. It's not surprising that radiation amounts seem so confusing with all the different ways they can be displayed. 
counts per minute refers to the number of radioactive particles that have passed through the tube in a given minute. A sievert is a measurement of dosage of radiation, and one sievert equals 1000 millisieverts, which can be written as MSV, like this. One millisievert equals 1000 microsieverts, which can be written with a strange little U like this and an SV. So there are one million of the microsieverts that my unit displays in one sievert. Similarly, a rentgen is another measurement of dosage of radiation, and one rentgen equals 1000 millirentgens, or MR. My Geiger counter displays millirentgens and microsieverts, and one millirentgen appears to be equal to 10 microsieverts. There was a guide card supplied with my Geiger counter. It shows radiation levels and what action you should take if you see these levels. It's referring to background radiation rather than radiation from a local known source such as my lens. If, for instance, you suddenly started getting readings of 1000 counts per minute, or 6.5 microsieverts per hour, within your home or workplace, that would be a pretty good reason to be concerned. For some kind of comparison, a standard dental x-ray appears to give you a dose of about 5 microsieverts. That dose happens in a very short time, let's say the x-ray takes one second. If you left the machine on for a whole hour, that would equal a dose rate of 18,000 microsieverts per hour, and it probably wouldn't do you much good. So I've gathered together some household items, all of which are radioactive to a greater or lesser extent. We have a banana. Bananas contain a small amount of potassium, which is radioactive. But before you panic and throw out all your bananas, wait and see how radioactive they actually are. Then we have a household smoke detector. The ionisation chamber contains a small amount of americium-241, which is radioactive. The americium is contained within the ionisation chamber and is completely safe under normal operating conditions. Next is an old luminous watch. Some old watch faces and hands used a luminous paint containing radium. The radium made the paint glow brighter and for much longer. Unfortunately, some of the workers who painted the dials used to shape the point of their brush by licking it, much the same as an artist painting with watercolours might do. This meant they ingested small quantities of radium each day, which was very detrimental to their health. Not all old watches have radioactive dials. I went through a box of about 30 old watches to find the best, or worst, depending on how you look at it. After that we'll test a mantle from a paraffin lamp. These old lamp mantles contain thorium. It made them glow much brighter and whiter. I've got an unused old mantle for this test. More recently they stopped using thoriated mantles, so any you buy now won't contain thorium. And finally we'll test my lens. The highest levels of thorium are in the rear elements, so we'll take our measurements from the back of the lens. So now we'll start off with the banana. The background radiation is hovering at around 23 counts per minute, or 0.16 microsieverts per hour, although this level will constantly fluctuate. And with the banana in place, there's no change at all. You wouldn't really expect there to be much, and certainly nothing that can be detected by my Geiger counter. Next, we'll test the smoke detector. The americium is located deep within the metal ionisation chamber, so it's pretty well shielded. If you were able to get the Muller tube in the Geiger counter closer to the americium, the reading would be higher, but as it is, the highest reading we get here is 82 counts per minute, or 0.53 microsieverts per hour. So now we'll take a look at the luminous watch. This is just the movement, face and hands. If you are actually wearing the watch, your arm would be slightly shielded by the back of the case. But there again, the watch is about 10mm away from the Muller tube in this test, and it would be in direct contact with your arm, so maybe these readings aren't that far off the dose you'd actually receive. 
I've got the warning alarm set to trigger at 200 counts per minute, as you can probably hear. Anyway, the maximum reading we got from the watch was 274 counts per minute, or 1.78 microsieverts per hour. And now we can test the lamp mantle. These are actually fairly radioactive, or at least they are in terms of things you might find around the house. Although when in use on a lamp, you probably wouldn't get that close to the mantle because it would be hot. Anyway, the maximum reading we got from the mantle was 1093 counts per minute, or 7.1 microsieverts per hour. And now we can finally see how much radiation is emitted by the lens. There's about a 6mm gap between the Muller tube and the case of the Geiger counter, and radiation levels fall off rapidly as the distance is increased. So if the Muller tube was actually in contact with the back of the lens, these readings would be higher. And the maximum reading we saw was 2,129 counts per minute, or 13.84 microsieverts per hour. So if you held the back of the lens 6mm away from your skin for one hour, you'd get a dose of radiation equivalent to 2.8 dental x-rays. Albeit this is a different and less penetrating form of radiation, but nevertheless close proximity to the back of the lens for long periods of time should possibly be avoided. As I mentioned earlier, radiation levels fall off rapidly as the distance from the source is increased. So if I place the lens 5 centimetres, or 2 inches, away from the Geiger counter, the radiation levels are significantly reduced, with a maximum reading of 467 counts per minute, or 3.04 microsieverts per hour. You often hear that these lenses only emit alpha radiation, which can be blocked by a sheet of paper. So let's try a whole book. The book is 12mm thick, and the increased distance alone will reduce the reading, regardless of whether the book actually blocks anything itself. And the maximum reading is 700 counts per minute, or 4.55 microsieverts per hour. So clearly these lenses don't just emit alpha radiation. Next we'll do what is possibly a more significant test, and see how much radiation passes through the camera to where your face will be when you're using it. This will vary from camera to camera. I'm using a Panasonic Lumix GX80 Micro Four Thirds camera for this test. And the maximum reading is 177 counts per minute, or 1.15 microsieverts per hour. And possibly equally relevant is the amount of radiation in the area of the focus ring, where your hands are likely to be. And here we get a maximum reading of 307 counts per minute, or 2 microsieverts per hour. And for our final test, I've read that you can stop beta radiation by wrapping an object in aluminium foil. In reality, you'd need a thicker layer of aluminium than this, but I've wrapped the lens loosely and folded over the ends. The lens is sitting a bit further away from the Geiger counter due to the loosely wrapped foil. And with all this, we still get a reading of 1084 counts per minute, or 7.05 microsieverts per hour. I wondered what effect all this radiation would have on the sensor, so I took two shots with the lens cap on. The shots were a two minute exposure, with all noise reduction turned off. I've cropped into the images so the noise is easier to see. Shot number one was taken using my Shinon 28mm lens, and shot number two was taken using the Super Takamar. The second shot has significantly more noise. The GX80 is quite noisy on long exposures anyway, but the radiation has had quite an effect. I don't know whether the radiation would have a long-term detrimental effect on the sensor, but I definitely won't be leaving this lens on the camera when not in use. So, what conclusions have we come to? Well, firstly, you can carry on eating bananas, they're quite safe and still just as tasty. 
The old thoriated lamp mantles are relatively safe when fitted to a lamp. Usually there's a glass shade or shield of some sort, preventing you from getting too close. A certain amount of care should be taken if you have unused old mantles. Don't store them in a bedside drawer, or carry them around in your pocket for long periods of time. And perhaps mark the packet as radioactive. Avoid ingesting or inhaling fragments of radioactive materials. For instance, the old lamp mantles become quite fragile when they've been used, so don't breathe in the dust if one breaks. Inside the body, the radiation can have a much greater effect. And definitely don't hold a radioactive lens up to your eye to look through it. Even the alpha radiation that we couldn't detect in this video can have a detrimental effect on your eyes at close range. And before you yell at the screen, no, this wasn't the Super Takamar lens. I used one of my non-radioactive Shinon lenses for this clip. And what about the big question? Is this lens safe? I've tried to give as much accurate information as possible in this video, but the equipment I've been using isn't calibrated, and the tests I've carried out haven't been done under laboratory conditions, so there's plenty of margin for error. In my opinion, this lens is safe to use for its intended purpose as a camera lens, but possibly I wouldn't want to use it all day, every day, and I certainly wouldn't want to keep it close to me when not in use. There would be plenty of people with different opinions, but probably only a radiation health expert would be able to give an accurate answer. If you now thoroughly put off the idea of owning a 50mm Super Takamar f1.4 lens, my suggestion as an alternative would be the 55mm Auto Shinon f1.4. My example definitely isn't radioactive, and like the Super Takamar, it takes really excellent shots. Anyway, I think this video has gone on far longer than planned. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. There'll be plenty more vintage stuff coming soon. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.